Welcome everyone to Genealogy Club. Um, tonight we're joined by genealogist Sarah Gutman. We're very happy to have you and um, thank you for joining us, Sarah. I'm going to mute myself. All right. And thank you, Erin, for letting me uh, be a guest today. And I always love coming on and seeing a thriving genealogy club. Um, and I'm sure many of you probably have experienced this with your own family that you get so excited about these finds and you want to tell everybody and your family just could not care less. At least that's the situation with me. So I love that there's a place to go that you can talk about the things that you're finding and also kind of learn from each other. So congratulations on finding a really great group. And Erin, I was just talking to her before, she seems wonderful. So thank you for having me today. So um, my name is Sarah Gutman and I'm just going to pop over here and get my um, PowerPoint up. Let's make sure everybody can see that and I'll put it in the... Uh, the format here. Cool. Can everybody see it? Yes. Can everybody see it? It does it look like a full screen? Yes. Like yes. Pretty much. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay, great, great, great. So my name is Sarah Gutman. Uh, I work for Legacy Tree Genealogist. I specialize in American research and also Italian, specifically dual Italian research. I have been doing this since I was 13 years old. I start, I am now 41. So I've been doing this for a while and I got to see the whole advent of the internet come out and everything online. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun. It's been a, quite a journey. And talking about journeys, that's what our topic is going to be tonight is talking about our immigrants coming over to America. And this is a little bit interactive. So feel free to comment. I have questions for you. If you wanted to shout out the answers, I don't have lollipops or anything that I could give you because we're online, but if we were in person, I'd have a little treat for you, but you'll just know the answers. That's good. Good enough, I guess. So some of the things we're going to be talking about tonight are why did people decide that they wanted to leave their country of origin and come over to America? Uh, what caused them to leave and what also, what is it that drew them to America, not some other place? We'll talk about the life on the passenger ships and they were not for the faint of heart. I would do atrocious if I had to go on one of them. We'll talk about what that was like and how that also has changed over the years. What happened when people arrived at the ports, uh, how the quota acts played into the number of immigrants that were coming over from different areas. We'll check out passenger lists, some of the things you might be able to find or not find from passenger lists and the different errors that there were. We'll look at natural history records and we'll also talk about where to find these records. I think, by the way, somebody might be listening to a uh, like a police scanner or something. Um, if you just wanna uh, just mute yourself if you want, just cause it's being recorded. Um, so let's bring it all the way back to our first census over in, 1790 it was the first time a census was taken in America and the face the literal face of America looked a lot different than they do today so based on the data that they've collected 49 percent are identifying as English but English um or just regular white American as you want to think of it we have 19 percent African we have 8% Scot-Irish, 7% Scottish, 7% German, 4% Dutch, 3% French, and 3% other. So that I think is very different from what we currently are as Americans. Um, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing a lot of my ethnicity is not representative in this. Anybody wanna take a guess or maybe you know, what is the ethnicity that the majority of Americans, the highest, I guess, ethnicity that most Americans can trace themselves back to? Anybody want to take a guess what country that is? Ireland. It's not Ireland, but it is listed on here. Germany. Yeah, Germany. Very good. So uh, the majority of Americans can trace their lineage back to Germany, and that's the highest um, ancestral group that we have here in America. So something changed 
a big adventure, I should say, kind of an invention happened um, that really was responsible for bringing people from Europe um, over to America. And this is region we are going to be focusing on Europe. This is kind of the time period that we're talking about. Uh, anybody want to take a guess what invention really was responsible for that? The sailing know. ships. Of what kind of ship? The sailing ships. It's a ship. It's it, what kind of ship? Steamship. A steamboat. Yeah, the steamboat. steamboat. Yep. So the steamboat, the advent of the steamboat was what really was the catalyst of getting people over to America. Um, the first steamboat to come over to America was in 1818. The first one across the Atlantic. And in 1838, we, so about 20, well, 20 years later, we have the SS Great Westerner. And that's the first wood hull and paddle ship to go transatlantic. And that's a picture of it right there. So that was huge for getting people to go across uh, the ocean. And it cut down the sailing time from two months to 15 days. So people are thinking of more taking that chance of saying, okay, I don't wanna do two months on sea, maybe I can do 15 days. Uh, so going over there. And it, in 1843, we have the SS Great Britain and it's the world's first ocean liner made from iron. So for however many years, I think eight years, we had wood hold steamboats coming over. That was kind of the main thing. And then they switched to the iron ship coming over. So what are some push and pull factors of, whoop, trying to switch over here. There we go. Push and pull factors that are bringing people over to this country. Um, I would kind of put it out there that people were not wanting to leave their home. That was not something that they just were like, you know what, I need a change of pace. I'm gonna just, you know, up and leave my family. Uh, they were really almost desperate to go and do that. So it really was a decision that I'm guessing was not easy to come by. They were often faced with drought and famine. I think a lot of us who might have Irish ancestry are very familiar with uh, the potato famine that happened over in Italy, um, especially in Southern Italy, the Mount Vesuvius kept erupting. That's one of the reasons that brought my family over here in that it just destroyed the land that the crops were on. So there was a lot of famine, there's a lot of drought, poverty. We have people who are in a rigid class system and they start hearing that they can come over to America to make this new life for themselves. They don't have to be peasant farmers anymore. Um, one of the other things is just talking about this rigid class system. I was reading this book and um, it's actually somebody from a genealogy club had recommended it to me. It's called uh, Murder in Madeira. And it's, it's a really good book. And it's about this woman who goes and she wants to solve a, a, basically a murder mystery that's in her ancestor, that happened to her ancestor. And what happened was the person went, uh, it was in prison and for murdering um, the landowner, the guy who owned the land of the Italian family, because it was common for on the person's wedding night that the person who owned that land um, would sleep with the wife first before the husband did. And that was just not something that that guy wanted and he <laughs> killed him. So it was a whole big to do. Um, but that was something that wasn't unheard of for Italians is that your landowner could have had full way with you and people wanted to escape that. Um, we have disease, different things they're trying to just get out of there, especially if they're in small communities to kind of get out. But basically between me and you, <laughs> The ship is the last place you want to be for disease. <laughs> That's just full on. We'll talk about that. There's just full German festiveness. Um, religious reasons, government tyranny. Sometimes people did not want to uh, serve in the military in Italy. And I will make a lot of references to Italy because that's what I work on all day. 
is they had instilled the draft for men who were over the age of, of 18. And they had actually started creating passports uh, because if you were over, if you left and your number, your name was called that you were supposed to be in the draft and you did not come back, you could never come back because you would be arrested. Um, so people would leave the country because they didn't want to serve in the military. Uh, some of the things that people wanted to come to America for is democracy, believing they had a say or having a say in their government and having this freedom to do whatever they wanted, or at least they believed that they could do whatever they wanted or they can make the most out of this land that was just full of opportunity. The streets are paved with gold and to join their friends and family. Now, people's friends and family did a really sneaky trick and they were able to do this because there was no such thing as the internet or TVs or and they weren't getting like cross Atlantic newspapers really over there. What they would do is they would come over to America. And this also happened when people move out West and they would get over here and they realized this is not that great. You know, we're stuck in this tenement. It stinks over here. I'm just working like a dog, but I'm going to tell my family and my friends that this is really good and you should come here too. And they would do that. A lot of times people, especially in the Italian neighborhoods, they would go to their parish priest because that was the one who would usually speak English and the foreign language. They would write to their family over in their other land. The priest would send the letter out to the priest from the other community. They would get that and they would read that letter and they would think, oh, this is, this sounds great. I'm going to go join them. Everything is wonderful over there. They come all the way over there and they realize this is, uh, this is actually not great at all, <laughs> but, but we're here and we're not going back. Um, there's a, a good book too, if you're looking for one, it's called The Seven or Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna. Um, and it talks about that. They did that with her family. They had all come over um, to Connecticut and they had realized that maybe the person writing them wasn't telling the truth. <laughs> so it, it's something interesting. Um, but of course there are many great reasons to come to America. And many people did find that this was a much better choice than staying in their other country. And personally, I have to thank my ancestors because I would not be sitting here today if they did not take that plunge over there. And I think probably most of us wouldn't be here either. So let's talk about ship conditions. Um, who here's ever been on a cruise? Okay, great, show of hands, I love it. When you went on your cruise, was your bed there for you? <laughs> Right. Like you're, I'm guessing like you were excited. You, you know, everybody always talks about going on these cruises that they're going to, they're always worried that they're going to gain weight um, from eating too much from the midnight buffet and everything. And it's all just living in the lap of luxury and being entertained. That was not the situation. That was probably the furthest possible thing of the situation that happened for people going on these ships. You were expected to... <laughs> You were expected, if you wanted to sleep in a bed or a mattress, you had to bring that yourself. Um, so you're going and you're carrying mattresses with you. Um, you had to bring your own food. And this is for earlier on. This is for um, pre about 1860. This is our Irish immigrants, a lot of them coming over here. Um, we'll talk about some of the reasons the they had to stop doing this. A lot of our Irish immigrants are doing this, a lot of our German ancestors. Um, you need to bring your own food. You need to bring your own bedding. You need to bring your own thing to make your food on there. Um, so you're bringing your own pots, pans, utensils. That is a huge shock for a lot of people who are about to get on the ship and they're ready to go. And they're like, oh, so did you bring your own food? And you're like, no, <laughs> no like I, can, I can barely get these kids going. I'm not bringing my own food for this two week uh, journey. Um, so that was a really big thing. What they would do is you would buy your ticket and about 80% 80, 80 of the ship buy their ticket and they would go down deck, lower deck, 
and it was open. It was kind of like an auditorium almost, but there's no windows. So you're under, there's no windows and they partition the men and the women. So the men and the women are both in separate. Oh, 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 Sorry. Um, oh, so um, you would go, they would partition the men and the women. Women would have their children with them and they would pretty much not have that much to do with each other until the end of their voyage. Um, you would have to make your own food. So there was obviously a lot of fires because people would start fires on this wooden decking. Um, definitely super not safe. Your bathrooms were not in this area. Uh, they were up top. And when it was rough seas, they would close the top. So you did not have access to the bathrooms and there was no ventilation in there. So that to me is like my ultimate nightmare. <laughs> like there, it's just awful. People are stealing from other people because they didn't bring food. Uh, they gave you a little bit of ration, um, but they would come and they would try to take your valuables, anything that you had. There was a ton of thievery going on there. You really needed to watch your back. Uh, there was just disease just running rampant because also what's happening is you're in this room you don't have a bathroom so you're going to the bathroom in these buckets you're throw people are throwing up they're getting sick so between that things are sloshing over you can just imagine how awful that smells and the disease that is just piling up with these people um now one of the things that the story of one of these ships was it was called the Elizabeth Sarah. And I remember that because my name is Sarah Elizabeth. That's the reverse of that. And that happened in July of 1847. And what happened was people were so desperate to leave Ireland that they boarded a, a, a steerage boat. A um, just, I'm sorry, just for um, a non-steerage boat. That's what I meant to say. So that's meant that it's bringing materials over. It's not meant for passengers. So it came with 276 people were left there. There was only 32 beds that it came with. So everybody else just was on their own and there was no working bathroom. Again, absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. The food and water was almost non-existent. They did not have any food ration. And the captain got off track and in what was supposed to be two weeks turned out to eight weeks. And 42 people died during this voyage. Um, that's where we get the, if you ever heard of the coffin ship, that's kind of where this comes from is it's these people who just bored this, they were so desperate to get out that they just wanted a way out and it was just extremely bad conditions. So we start seeing uh, acts being made. And one of the first ones was the Carriage of Passenger Act in 1855. Now, this was made, the US made this. This did not translate into all other nationalities. It wasn't one of those, um, like the, uh, the international sea rules. So boats coming into America, we're supposed to have at least for one person, you were supposed to have 18 square feet of clear space because they used to just pack people in too bad. You know, we can get money out of you. You're coming in. They had a minimum provisions. They said, okay, you know, everybody here is going to get three loaves of bread uh, during the day, coffee, whatever. They'll supply them with the basic needs. They required ventilation. So they no longer were allowed to just put people in windowless areas and just close the top and say, hope to see you in the morning. Um, they needed ventilation that was there. They mandated a hospital on each ship. This word hospital is very loose. Um, it really was just somebody in the medical profession who was on board that ship. And that hospital was something that could be considered moving so it kind of traveled with that doctor. So his hospital was about 20 square feet of his personal radius. That's your hospital is this moving doctor. 
um, <clears throat> there has to be at least one working bathroom for every 100 passengers. And a captain can be fined $10 for every passenger who died of a disease. Um, now, this last one has something to do with my own personal family. My mother-in-law would tell the story when her grandmother came over to America from Ireland. Um, she was five months pregnant at the time. And she gave birth to a baby who um, had passed away right after birth. And the ship captain made her throw the baby overboard mm -hmm. uh, because he said that he did not want other people in uh, the ship getting disease, anything that could have happened with a baby passing away. Obviously, this is something that is so devastating to anybody. And it's a story that's still being told um, you know, almost 150 years later that this is something that happened. And I, I wonder, just looking at this, if the captain did that for disease or was he more concerned that he did not want to get fined, um, that people had, somebody had passed away on his ship. If you do look at a passenger record, you find maybe your family in one of them, you can go to the, the back, the last page, and the captain is supposed to have recorded anybody who died uh, during the voyage there. Um, so that is something I have yet to really see anybody writing that down. I think maybe I've come across that once, um, but they are, were supposed to have written that in the back of the passenger records if anybody passed away. Also too, if people were detained uh, for an extended period of time, that's also supposed to be recorded there. Um, now ships were still requiring or could require people to bring their own pots pans and utensils. Um, it, the food that they served on board was usually not prepared. Um, it was just something that really pretty much bread. You know, they didn't want to be cooking. So, but if you wanted to cook for yourself, you wanted to start a fire on the boat, pff, go for it. They, <laughs> I feel like somebody really needed to kind of monitor that, but now, in 1908, we'll talk about this in a second, we go from steerage class and what would they start calling it to third class. And the people in the third class then start getting, um, you can re request to have your own room. And that would became a common thing. And this is an example of the evolution of third class. This is much, much better than people just sitting in a, um, you know, the giant kind of auditorium looking there. So often what would happen is it would come with bunk beds. Um, they had men and women's cabin. You could ask to have your family be together in one cabin. They were allowing uh, families to do that. In 1900, a steerage ticket would cost about $30. And as of last year, not sure what it is with inflation right now, who knows, about a million, but it was equivalency to $1,077 for a third class passenger ticket. Um, they did have shared restrooms. The restroom was not in the room itself. Like how if you would you go on a cruise, your bathroom is not there. It was usually down the hole. Any questions, comments on life on the ship? I have a question. Sure. What is in the middle of this picture here? Oh, great. Okay. So this um, looks like it is some type of trash can. And also I think it's a sink that they have there. But interestingly, it looks like they're getting the, t the, uh, the water up in here. Mm -hmm. That's what my, if anybody's in like the plumbing industry and you know this better and you're like, and you know what this is, please let me know. Um, but that's always been my understanding. And this is a, man, a man's bunk. This is a single man's bunk uh, that people would go to pay for. Any questions? No, good, okay. So the first, a lot of our immigrant ancestors, if they came before 1890, um, through the Port of New York, they arrived in Castle Garden. Um, and anyone could just totally just pass through Castle Garden. There was really no inspection. They just walked in, they walked out. 
And it was run by New York. It is not run on a federal level. It's just run in the state of New York. And this is what we have the old waves of immigrants coming through. So the old waves is we're having a lot of our German, French, uh, Scots, Irish, basically those people that we were seeing on that 1790s uh, census, those are a lot of the people who are still coming in and they're coming through Castle Garden. You can find these records for Castle Garden online on Ancestry on Family Search. And they had its political cartoon here. And this is what life was like once you got out of Castle Garden. Now, as I mentioned, they did not have anybody really in there kind of directing you or anything. You were just on your own. You don't speak the language. You're coming out to this new country and there is all these things waiting here for you. Um, they would have people that would set up little booths and they would try to sell what they were marketing as American food. And that was often moldy and rotten. They would sell um, sausage with God knows what inside of it and say that that was something that Americans liked to eat. Uh, they would make lemonade, but they would just douse it with straight molasses and lemon rinds. And they would just charge money for it, you know, just try to make it. One of the biggest traps that people would fall into was somebody who was saying that they were changing their money over. Uh, into American currency and they weren't they were just taking the money and leaving these people flat and broke um, people were there they were saying they have boarding houses we have other people who would just actually wait at the uh, the ship station and they would say oh I'm I'm supposed to be waiting for you. I was told that, you know, you're from my village, you're from my country, I'm going to take care of you. And they did not. They just led that person astray. They were just a complete swindler and would just unfortunately take these people's money that who had just traveled so far to get here. So then in 1892, we have Ellis Island. And I always wonder what happened between 1890 and 1892 because Castle Gardens was closed and Ellis Island didn't open up to 1892. I have yet to find that answer. Um, I'm sure if people just kind of just had boats just still coming in and they just kind of walked off if they were going to other ports because we do have other ports and I'll talk about that later that people are coming into, but especially being from New York, as we are, I dare to say many of our immigrant ancestors also came through this port as well. So when Ellis Island opened up, they're really seeing, they're kind of catering to this new wave of immigrants. And we're seeing Italians, Russians, Poles, Hungarians, Serbs, Slavics, Jews, Armenians, Turks. And what's really different about this group or these groups is they're coming off the boat and they're settling in the cities. We have the industrial revolution. The cities are places where jobs are and they're creating their own little communities. So we have little Italy. We have Chinatown. I just got stuck in my cord here. <laughs> we have all these little communities where people are coming together and creating their own little groups similar to what they had over in Europe and they're speaking that language. They're speaking in native tongues. They're creating churches. They're having synagogues that cater to their particular ethnic group. So that's something that's different from the first wave of immigrants here. Now, what's interesting too about Ellis Island is people who paid for first class and second class tickets did not go through Ellis Island. They simply bypassed that what would happen is a doctor would get onto the boat and they would give people the exams who paid first and second class. They would then, and then they would let those people leave. They would just get out. They would go to New York, no questions asked. Um, the people who are in the third class passengers, they went on to Ellis Island for this kind of rigmarole of different questions and different exams for them. 
So one of the things that they do is a medical exam. And it was six seconds long. And this was something that people dreaded because what they're doing is they're lining up. You have a man here who has a flashlight. You've probably never seen a flashlight in your life. There's a very good chance of that. Um, and he's scoping. Oh, somebody say something. No. He's scoping you out. He's rolling. He's taking, sometimes they would take this type of wire and they would pull out your eyelid. They would check underneath it and they would swab it. And that's really scary for a lot of people. I know even my great, my grandmother, she's Italian. So when she had my uncle back in the fifties, she, the story, she flipped out at the doctor because he had wanted to um, do a C-section and she was terrified because she was always told that her belly button held was the knot that held all your air into your body. And if he touched her belly button, she was <laughs> like, again, this is the fifties. My grandmother, rest her soul, was not the most intelligent person in the world, but this was some thing that her mother had told her and her mother had told her. So who knows like what these people are believing, who, what, you know, they're touching. Are they going to deflate me? I don't know. But these people are flipping out um, and they come in and they have chalk. And so you, they sit here, they look at you and they write these little letters on you. And you have no idea what these letters mean, but you know, if you got this letter on you, you're going to go sit somewhere. So people are terrified. They have no idea if they're being sent back, if their children are being sent back, they don't know what they're being sent back for. And many times the person who's doing the exam does not um, speak their language. Even too, if you're pregnant, they're writing PG on you. You just got something. You have no idea that, oh my gosh, what, what's wrong with me? You're just pregnant. Um, you know, you're okay. Don't worry about it. But that was a really, really big thing. Now, only 2% of people, we hear about people getting sent back over to their country. Only about 2% of people, which is a lot, um, are being sent back. And this is usually not for medical reasons. This is because there are stowaways, because there are criminals. Um, and if you were sick, they often would just put you into their hospital. They had an infirmary on Ellis Island and they would care for you there. If you really had something awful, then they would send you back on the ship. And you can find this on the back of, um, again, this is one of those things they can find on the back of the passenger list. And one of the things that they also did was if you looked at passenger list, you'll often see that they ask, who do you know in this country? Who's going to vouch for you when you come to this country? If you were a woman, you were not allowed to leave Ellis Island without the, um, escort, escort, escorting, escortion. I don't know. I think it just made up a word without a man escorting you out. Um, you had to know a particular man to say, yes, you can come with me. Um, she, you know, she's not becoming a lady of the night and I'm going to vouch for you. And this was a really, you know, you think about it, these women who probably maybe had some really bad situations in their country of origin, who wanted to escape, um, they couldn't do that. Or they could do that. They got over here and they said, well, where's this man who's supposed to be vouching for you? I don't have one. You know, they might have saved up. However, they're sending her back. Um, and that is something that I can't imagine just being absolutely terrified. I watched, or I found this one and the woman was waiting on Ellis Island for two weeks um, because they were waiting for a male relative to come and get her. And I just wonder her story, you know, like they're not allowing her to write back to the family. And this isn't a cell phone. We could just pick them up and say, hey, I'm at Ellis Island, come get me. Um, they need to figure out a way to get you there, that you are there. So I, I'm not really quite sure the story of that, but I can imagine she was terrified um, during that time period. Now, one of the biggest myths that you've heard or maybe you thought or at any time is that people change their name at Ellis Island. And that is not true. Not a single person's name was ever changed at Ellis Island. Um, 
And sometimes I feel like that's, you know, you have like those dolls that have the string and you pull the string out of their back. I feel like I say that all the time. Like <laughs> not a single person's name is changed out of silence. Um, but it's, it's true. Their names were written down by usually a person who spoke the language when they got onto the ship. They had a representative there from the shipping company and it was the people on the ship writing that down. That list then went to individuals, these men like this, and they would, you would come up to the booth and they would ask you up to 17 identifying questions compared to the ship, who you are. They could ask you how much, they usually asked you how much money you had. Um, you had to have, I think a minimum of $30. And what people would often do is they didn't, you know, make, they didn't take that $30, but they would just pass $30 down the line to them and just say like, here's my $30. And then they'd give it to the next person. I don't know why nobody caught on to this, but that's the story behind it. Uh, they would ask you, uh, you know, who else are you traveling with? How long are you staying for? Have you ever been in this country? Who is the person in your country that remains there? Kind of like your emergency contact, if you will. The person over here, uh, are you planning on going back? Help, you know, what was your job? Things like that. So they would just compare that to the information that is already on the passenger list. They are not actually writing anything down. And we do have several other ports of arrival. So we have um, commonly Angel Island over in California. A lot of Asian families immigrated through that way. We have Baltimore, Boston, Philadelphia, New Orleans, New York, which includes Castle Gardens, Ellis Island, um, Galveston, Texas. And it's important to, especially for our family who's living in New York, I think oftentimes they automatically just say, yes, I came through New York. But it's surprising how many people actually really didn't, uh, that they came through other places. There's a ton of Italian immigrants who came into Louisiana. And the reason they did that is because many of them, um, I'll go into this, this is my segue. Uh, many of them uh, were not allowed to come in as Italian, Italian residents. So they had to live for a period of time in Brazil and Argentina because of these exclusion acts uh, that the government put into place. So the government realizes we're getting flooded with immigrants. We have to do something about this. And the first group that they really target is the Chinese. Um, and they create the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, regulating federal immigration. And as World War I comes into play, we're seeing lots of people from Europe trying to flee over. And we do not, our government's saying we don't have the resources um, to handle this. So what we have to do is we have to set limits of what percent of the people's countries that will allow immigrants from. So um, they start doing a percentage. I have it written here. I'm looking, do, 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 do. I'm trying to scroll down. I have my notes on the side here. Uh, but it was a percentage of the country that they would take the, the immigrants from. So what a lot of people would do is they would go and they would stay in other countries for a period of time, and then they would immigrate that way. So there's a ton of Italians, like I said, who lived in South America for a while, and then they came up to America to get around these exclusion acts that happen. Mm -hmm. So check that out too. If you're not seeing your family where you think you're seeing, do some research uh, as to maybe what exclusion acts were happening at the time period and where was a common country for them to go to temporarily uh, before coming over to America. Of course, we have Canada and people doing some land crossings that way. But again, South America is a big thing. And if people were in South America, they're coming in um, from Louisiana and Galveston, Texas. Any questions, comments, anything like that? I just realized the time, I'm like, wow, I thought I was talking for like 10 minutes. It's already 7.45. So um, passenger list. Passenger list, we have three errors of them. We have 1790 to 1820. Um, for, before 1820, 
the captain was not required to take down the names of the people traveling mm -hmm. on the boat. One of the reasons that the Mayflower is so great is because whoever wrote those names down did a phenomenal job and they kept them. Um, there was a ton of other people that had been in our country, but they didn't write the names down and they didn't keep those names. So we often at work get requests to find people's ancestors who came over here prior to 1820. They want to find the passenger list and we can kind of look for them, but we 99% we don't find them. Um, sometimes random historical societies will have them. They may or may not have made it onto online websites, but again, they're not mandated to do that. Uh, between 1820 and 1890, we have a very basic passenger list here. Uh, this is a, something that you might see. This is my family. And this is an example of a person having one job and messing it up. Um, this family here, so my family is the Wanners down here, is Joseph and Marie, and it says that they're 28. And this person just wrote that they're all farmers, la la la, and everyone's from France, and everyone's going to New York. Well, they are not from France, they are from Germany. <laughs> so this person just kind of scribble scrabbled. And I'm thinking like you were on the boat for two weeks. What else were you doing? You can at least ask the people where they're coming from, get it down. But it's not that accurate of information. Um, and again, they start doing this in 1820 is because they want to be responsible for the people who are coming over here. So this is a much better passenger list. We have 1906 and 1912 are some of the errors of passengers list where they really start beefing it up and adding some great information on here. Um, this is my family and they had sailed in, where's my mouse? There we go. So this is my family over here, the Gadotti family. This is a two part one. So we have their names and interestingly, um, the woman's name is written as Gadotti. They, did not have her maiden name or the name she would have gone by because Italian women did not change their last name when they married. Uh, so that person had written her married name. And we have the ages, we have the occupations, we have if they're able to read and write, where they're from, the actual town of origin, which sometimes I just want to give these things a nice big kiss when I see things like this, when he tells the actual town of origin, uh, the person who knew you over there. And I guess we're just saying it's Carmine. Um, no, no other information on Carmine here. They're going to New York. They uh, have a, I can't see if there's something about a ticket. Oh, who paid for the passenger ticket themselves. Sometimes people will say a family member. You can do some research on that if they ever went to America, if they're going to be joining somebody and who are they joining and their address, which is a great, if you can't find people in census records, check out who they're saying that they're joining. That's a good clue. Uh, Cause then you can kind of do some research stalking them to find some information. Their good physical condition. You get some height and weight, the color of their hair and eyes. And I always hope, and I can say this because I am very short, um, they always hope that people are either very tall or very short because that makes my life a lot easier. I was chasing one man who I was able to identify because he was four foot seven um, in records and he had a very common last name, but because he was so short, I could pick him out in these things. So that was, that was cool. So I can get him on the passenger list because it gave me his height. And we have again, their place of birth. Um, so this is a really great record, really full of detail. If you look at this too, um, may or may not know this, but these passenger records, sometimes you might see numbers written, kind of like they look like random numbers. What are these random numbers? Those are actually, um, go back to their naturalization records. So if you see in these things that they have some of these like random numbers, like almost like a serial number written, if that person naturalized and that's their naturalization record. So that's a good clue for later on. 
Um, interesting fact about this family, this family was originally supposed to leave for America the week after the Titanic sank. And I have their passenger records and their names are just crossed right out. <laughs> So I wonder if they were like, yeah, we're not doing this. <laughs> and then they came a few months later over. So again, things to find on the passenger records, uh, looking for occupations, town of origin, have they ever been to the US? If the answer is yes, you can go back and look to see if there might be some more records, amount of money, uh, names of people that are over there. And some of the places to find passenger records, this is a genealogy group, so I'm guessing you're probably familiar with places, uh, especially like Family Search and Ancestry. Uh, we also have the Ellis Island Foundation. I like Ellis Island um, website a lot because they let you search for, uh, they could do, you could do a search by a ship or you could do it by date. So if you maybe know that your family came over on this boat, but it's not registering, that might be because that person had really sloppy handwriting and it's not being picked up by our computer intelligence. But you can go onto Ellis Island and you can search uh, through dates and you can search by uh, ship names. So that's pretty cool. You can't do that on other genealogical websites. Ancestry boasts that they have the largest collection of immigration records and they often do have a lot of great stuff you can go into their card catalog if you don't ever use that i suggest doing it because it's pretty cool go into their card catalog and you can filter if you put in new york passenger records or wherever you think your family might be coming from to do it through there some places also kept immigration records where they when they left over here i don't know as I'm moving, I'm knocking my computer down. I'm like, this thing's going to be on the ground by the time I'm done with this. Um, so a lot of places keep immigration record of when people are leaving. Um, I'm really excited because Italy did this and they're not available online yet, but they made people when they left Italy, they were supposed to register with a passport and say when they were going. Uh, but those records are not available online. But a lot of places like Norway, Scotland, um, we do have, uh, I think there was somewhere else in here, some other country I know, but they have their records available online. You can check them out. Now, another place to learn about your family's voyage is on their naturalization records. And if you go on Family Search, you go on Ancestry, you may have found a, something that looks like this. And I remember when I first saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I just found my ancestors' naturalization records. This is before I became a professional genealogist. Um, and I was collecting these. So I was like, yeah, I got them. Like I got all the naturalization records. Well, this is not actually a naturalization record. This is just a Rolodex entry. Um, if you think of like an index card again, it's a Rolodex. And it's just telling you that a record exists. And that's sometimes, that's great. That's just the ticket that you need. So this here is saying, this is for my great, great grandpa, John Gentile. He's in Simsbury. And we have the petition number right here. And this is also gonna be really big if you have to request their records from the USCIS. If you're looking for that, you wanna be able to know their record because that will save you $65 and about a year and a half of waiting. So that's cool. Um, so our ancestors did leave a good paper trail. They have their declaration of intent, which is their first papers. They can file that right after they arrive or soon after they arrive, about two years in this country. And then we have the petition for naturalization and that's five years after the arrival. And that's when people will take their oath of allegiance and saying, yes, I do want to become a citizen. Now, just like our uh, passenger records, naturalization records have come a long way um, over a period of time. Now, an early naturalization record looks something like this. This is my great-great-grandfather. Uh, we have his name, Johnny Vanko. He later changed it, does not document this here. And it tells me when he came to America, um, his age and his current address. That's it. And it says he came from Austria. That's it. Um, not a lot of information. This could be very disappointing. 
Now, a really important date to know, does anybody know the, I'll just ask, does anybody know the date when it became a federal process to take over naturalization records? Anybody have any idea? Okay, great, 1906. 1906 is a really big year for naturalization. The federal government's like, we got this. Everybody else just back up. It's under our control now. So prior to 1906, you could be naturalized in any court. Um, circuit courts, federal courts, uh, district courts, county court, all the courts. Um, and your records are there. Those records are there. They did not move to the National Archives. They're stuck in those courts. So you have to find out where your family is. Um, your census records are gonna be really good clues for that because you can figure out where they are in certain locations, see if they naturalize, and then reach out to those different courts in that area to try to find a naturalization record. And because it's just run by the local courts, they can put out any type of information that they want. I'm sorry, any form that they want. They do not have a regulated form. So some places may have asked for your birthday or where you're from, but the majority didn't. Uh, this is an example of the government, the federal government taking over this record collection. So we get a whole bunch of lot more information. So we have the guy's name. We have his uh, profession. We have what he looked like, the name of the actual village that he's coming from, uh, the birth date, the name of the ship. We see his uh, signature down here by the name that he's currently going by. So lots of really great stuff in these records. Same thing here, this is in the 1930s. We get a picture, I love seeing this. This is my great grandpa. Um, It'll also tell you the name that if he changed his name, what was the name that the family or he was currently under? It will tell you that in these records. Sometimes that's the only official um, documentation that you will have that somebody changed their name. And we have the names of his kids, where his wife was born, um, when they were married, lots of really great stuff in these, these records. And again, same thing, we have a petition for naturalization. And I'm just kind of going through that just to be respectful of everybody's time. So where can you find naturalization records? Um, there are a lot on family search. Now, many of, as you may or may not know, um, many of family searchers records are not yet digitally indexed. Uh, something really cool that happened during the pandemic was all the records that were in Salt Lake City got digitized and are available online. So all those records that people used to go all the way out to Salt Lake City for are now in your computer. Um, it was something that was supposed to originally take 50 years to do. So I would have, I'm guessing I would have been dead by then. Um, but they were able to accomplish it in a year and a half because of the shutdown. Um, they yet have been able to go in and uh, individually put them into an indexable searchable database. So what often you have to do is go into something like family search, go into the catalog or go into images and put in the name of the location that you believe that your family is from. I always like to start with the state and then I go down to the county and then I go down to the town. And you'll see many cases naturalization records and you could check out those collections there. And you can go into the individual collections and think of it kind of like a book, like you're going in and you're looking through the book with the indexes and everything. But that's where you can get a lot of these records for. Now you can also, if you have Ancestry, you could do a search on there. Um, now the website German Roots, they have a state-by-state -state guide of where you might be able to find naturalization records for your family. And prior to 1906, a central record place doesn't exist. So you really do need to go and go through those individual jurisdictions to find those records for them. Now, if you're totally stuck or if you're looking for something like dual citizenship and you can't get your records on a local level, you can order them from USCIS. And I personally hate doing this. I do it multiple times a day and I hate doing it because it takes so long um, and it's so expensive. So, so you want to find out if your great grandfather ever naturalized. 
you would send a request to the USCIS um, at this website down here. It's $65 and then it takes about a year to get the results. The results are simply just saying, yes, we have the record or no, we don't have the record. If you want the record, you can now wait another few months and pay us another $65. This rate is going up to, I think it's 300 and something dollars um, relatively soon. And they're going to do the thing where they just request it and then they give you the record. But I don't know about you, but $300 is a lot of money for me. Um, so I would personally rather just kind of poke around on family search and try to find the record that I need. But that's how you do it if you need it. So with that, I think I'm right at 801. All right. Um, look, I'd love to take any questions, any comments that anybody has. I'll um, stop screen sharing so we can see it on the big screen. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to stop the recording now and um, we'll do questions. Did I stop my, I think I stopped sharing, right? Yes, you did. Okay, cool. <laughs>